Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsuho. For today's video, we are going to be covering our first ever killer couple case. We are going to be talking about Charmaine Phillips and Peter Grandling, who um, have often been dubbed as South Africa's very own Bonnie and Clyde. So yeah, they operated in the 1980s. So yeah, let's get into it. But before we do that, I do have to give you guys a content warning or a couple of content warnings actually. In this video, I do talk about mental illness, alcoholism, S assault and domestic abuse. I don't go into too much detail about any of the things I just mentioned. However, if you don't think that's something that you're interested in watching, then this video probably isn't for you. So maybe you can watch some of my other videos or just wait for my next upload. This case did take place in the 1980s, so there aren't that many pictures so I'm so sorry about that but yeah first I'm gonna tell you guys about Charmaine Phillips they I couldn't find her birthday anywhere but just based on when this case took place and how old she was when it happened she was born in the early 1970s and her mother was an alcoholic and her father had been diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was just in his early 20s but he didn't take any medication for this instead he relied heavily on marijuana and this kind of like increased his psychotic episodes instead of like helping him so yeah growing up Charmaine was in a very unstable household she had three older siblings and eventually her mother did fall pregnant with twins and not too long after the twins were born um, her and her older siblings were taken out of the home and placed into the foster care system and because Charmaine grew up in a very like unstable home with a lot of trauma around her she would often wet her bed and records show that her foster parents would often beat her up as punishment for wetting the bed. Eventually though Charmaine and her siblings were returned to their parents and soon after this her mother did fall pregnant again and after she had given birth her alcoholism had kind of led to her um, having a lot of depressive episodes and had like a lot of uncontrollable anger that she would pass on to the children and she had once accused Charmaine's father of having sexually abused some of the children but this has never been proven or disproven but after this the two of them did separate and Charmaine's father left he was eventually admitted into a psychiatric hospital and he would often go see his children but like essentially he was just like a deadbeat so just as quickly as he would go see them he would just like disappear and they wouldn't hear from him for like months at a time. Charmaine's mother had also tried to unalive herself on several occasions in front of Charmaine so like she obviously would witness all of this and be like very traumatic for her and mind you this was all before she was like 10 years old and when she was 10 her mother did decide to relocate like her and the entire family like all of the children to KZN. They did receive monthly um, money from the state however just to make ends meet Charmaine's mother did decide side um, to get into sex work just you know to help the family just get more money like more income for the household however she would do like her business transactions in the family home so all of the children would witness what she does to get money and eventually like the neighbors would see like how the children were living just like their way of life and they knew it wasn't that great so because of this they did call social welfare on them and eventually social workers did take all of the children and place them into the foster care home and they were permanently removed from Charmaine's mother's um, primary care and after this this would be the last time that Charmaine would see either of her siblings or her mother and she did learn that a couple of years later her mother was um, beaten to death by one of her boyfriends in a domestic dispute. 
Charmaine would bounce from one foster care home to another and when she was 14 years old she finally decided that she had had enough and she just wanted to get out of the system so she went to her foster care parents drawer they had like a drawer next to their bed and okay bedside table <laughs> rather so she went to the bedside table and took out the money that they kept there she baked them a cake and then she wrote a letter to her foster care parents and she just thanked them for everything that they had done for her and she apologized for taking the money that they had like essentially saved up and she just left. Charmaine knew that she had to make ends meet to just kind of survive so because of this she decided to become a sex worker and eventually while she was working she she did meet um, a Lebanese sailor who would leave his boat by the Durban harbour and the two of them got into a relationship and eventually she did fall pregnant but after she told the sailor he kind of like kicked her off the boat and after this she went to PE like Port Elizabeth to a home for unwed mothers and eventually she did give birth to her first son who she named Ricky Lee and mind you she was only 16 years old when this happened and whilst she was in the home for unwed mothers like the authorities there would like kind of convince her to go back to school and told her that it would be in like her best interest as well as her son's best interest for her to kind of like better her education so that she could give herself and her son a better life and whilst she would go back to school Ricky Lee would go Sorry, Ricky Lee would be in foster care and once she was done and she was able to provide this better life for herself and her son, she would get Ricky Lee back. So that was the plan. So she decided to go back to school and this was literally so short lived. She was in school for literally only three hours three hours before deciding that no I don't want to do this I don't want no part of this and she literally just walked out she walked out and somehow she convinced the social workers to give her Ricky Lee back even though they had a plan for when she would get Ricky Lee back and after this she found herself a new man he was a sailor too but instead of him being Lebanese he was Greek and the two of them got into a relationship and Charmaine would live with him like on his boat when he would dock by the harbor but when he would go out for work she would continue her sex work. Charmaine would later say I discovered that selling my empty heartless body was just as popular in Port Elizabeth as it was in Durban. Charmaine and her Greek boyfriend did eventually get married and she says it was a very like impulsive decision spur of the moment and they had a plan the plan was that like he would take her and Ricky Lee to Greece and that's where they would live so one day when he left the harbor for work which obviously like he would do here and then he left and this time he just didn't come back like they had a plan and he just like never returned and because of this Charmaine and her husband couldn't have like an official divorce but her marriage was eventually annulled be um, based on abandonment. After this Ricky Lee was permanently taken from her care and he was eventually adopted by an Irish couple and Charmaine would never see her first son ever again. Shortly after this she did reconnect with an ex-boyfriend and the two of them would just go out and like rob people so that they could have money to feed into their marijuana addiction and at this time she was literally only 17 years old like she has been through so much already and she's only 17 when she and her ex-boyfriend were out like you know just looking for people to rob and she met a man and his name was Peter Grandley even though she was only 17 and he was literally like in his 30s I don't think it was like his early 30s I think like mid to late 30s they like the two of them started chatting and there was like a spark and then the two of them started seeing each other like this 17 year old girl and this like 30 something year old man 
Peter grew up completely different to Charmaine. He grew up in a farming community in Ermelo and his family was, was very kind and loving and they said that growing up he was a very like kind, wonderful young man. However, when he was in his 20s, he did go to prison for a weapons charge and his family says before this he wasn't very violent but after he came out of prison he was like, a completely different man and they blame his time in prison to like the violent acts that he would later commit and they would also blame Charmaine for like who Peter would later become. When Charmaine had met Peter he had recently been released on bail for his weapons charge. Peter also had a wife, an ex-wife rather, and a son and they lived in Ermelo too. Peter and Charmaine had a lot of things in common but not like the things that we would be like or like normal things have in common like you know like watching the same sitcoms or liking I don't know like the same like normal stuff like the things they had in common were like partying and drugs and like paying for these things through illegal ways of obtaining money you know what I mean so the two of them then started like robbing people together so they would spend most of their time on the road and just stopping and just pointing guns at people and robbing them of like all their valuables and this is when Peter taught Charmaine that she didn't really have to be in sex work to get money and the best way for her to get money is just to point a gun at random people and they would give them like all their valuables. Eventually Peter took Charmaine to Ermelo so that she could meet his man and she also met his ex-wife and son at the same time and she would later say that she noticed how violent Peter was with his ex-wife but she really didn't think anything of it and um, I'm just assuming that maybe it's because like it's his ex so she was like oh like he doesn't have to be kind to her or anything like that like they're divorced they're not together you know but I'm just I'm just guessing. And then in 1982, Peter and Charmaine welcomed their first son together and they named him Peter Key. Like, you know, this Peter, and then they're like Peter Key. Like, not even like Peter Jr. Peter Key. On the 15th of June 1983, the now family of three were in Kloti and the pair had run out of money and they were literally just itching for drugs and alcohol so they needed to find their next victim so that they could get all this money so that they could be able to get everything that they essentially needed. So they decided to go to a bar in Durban known as Smugglers and Smugglers was known for having like sailors, rich kids kids, sex workers, so they thought that this was like the perfect place for them to go to, to go and find their next victim. So at this time, 39-year-old Gerald Mayer had been surfing the whole day and he just decided that he wanted to grab a couple of beers, like after his long day, and just sit at the bar and watch some rugby. So Gerald was there, he was doing that, and then he was joined by Peter. And him and Peter just started chatting and Peter invited him to like join him and his girlfriend and their son at the table so Jill went and he joined the three of them and they were having like a conversation like they were chatting for a couple of hours they had like a couple of things to drink so because of this Jill didn't find it odd when Peter asked if he wanted to join them like for a short ride to find a spot where they could smoke a couple of joints and at this point Jill had his guard down like they'd been chatting for a while maybe he felt like he like he kind of knew them you know like it wasn't odd or anything like that out of the ordinary so then the four of them hopped into Peter's car and they started driving and at this point they had been driving for 20 minutes and Gerald just asked Peter like why don't you just stop at like a random place so we can just like smoke these joints like why are you driving for so long and Peter told him like no like I don't want to stop just anywhere like I don't want us to be disturbed by the police which kind of made sense to Gerald and eventually they stopped at like this wooded area that's close to cane fields and as soon as the car stopped Gerald had zero time to think to react before he was pulled out of the car and Charmaine and 
Peter held a gun to him, like pointing at his face. And they just robbed him of everything that he had in his pockets. They searched, they took all his valuables and everything. And Gerald instinctively pulled his hands up to his face and he was shot in the head and he died almost instantly. They left Gerald's body in the cane fields and they drove away and for the next couple of days the couple laid low because they just didn't want to draw any attention to themselves because obviously Gerald had last been seen with them and eventually Gerald was reported missing and his body had been found but the couple weren't suspects because no one like thought that the couple with like a newborn baby sort of thing would be involved in Gerald's murder and a couple of days after that the pair decided to leave Durban they drove away and they headed towards Richards Bay when they got to Richards Bay Peter called up a friend and just asked if he could spend a couple of nights there with Charmaine and Peter Key and this friend said yes so they were there for a couple of nights and one night Peter decided that he wanted to go out to a local bar and just grab a beer or two and when he eventually returned home he was not alone and he came home with 28 year old Vernon Alexander Swart and Vernon was looking for a lift to Impangeni and coincidentally um, Peter said that Charmaine and Peter Key were also going to Impangeni so like he would just give Vernon a lift and Vernon said yes so that's why he showed up at the house with him so the three of them Charmaine Vernon and Peter were there they were drinking a bit smoking a couple of joints and eventually Peter said that it's time for them to leave and go to Impangin so they got into the car and they had been driving for about an hour at this point and Peter decided to stop in stop at a little town in a little town called Malmouth and as soon as the car stopped literally Vernon had no time to react or just ask what was going on before he was pulled out of the car and tied to a tree and as quickly as he was tied to that tree he was shot in the head and died almost instantly after this Charmaine and Peter just went through his pockets and they saw his wallet 270 rand and just a couple of photographs that Vernon had on him. After this they went back to the friend's house and they only spent one night there before they left and they just went from one town to the next trying to keep a low profile just trying to make sure like that police aren't onto them like on their trail or anything like that and wanting to keep like wanting to keep like a big distance between them and the two bodies that they had left behind they decided to go to Peter's hometown Ermelo whilst they were in Ermelo Peter met a 32 year old man and his name was Baron Greifenstein and he too was looking for a lift to Kinros and coincidentally Peter was going there with his girlfriend and their baby so he took Baron and he told Baron that no like before we go to Kinros we just have to stop um, in Secunda because I have a bride with a couple of friends there and Baron didn't see any problem with this like he didn't mind being the couple's um, plus one and yeah um, Peter wasn't lying there was a bride there and they got there like you know they were drinking with Peter's friends having conversation and sometime during the night they were watching rugby and Baron as a joke just said you know what I would bet my last 800 rand in my bank account that this team is going to win and immediately as he said this Peter stood up and was just like okay it's time to go let's go we need to like get to Kendros now so the four of them hopped into the car and they drove for a little while before Peter stopped the car at a nearby dam in Ermelo and even before Byron could like ask what was going on or like why they had stopped randomly he was dragged out of the car and he was robbed of his bank card and his pocket knife after this Peter and Charmaine pointed a gun at him and asked him for his bank card pin and as soon as he gave the bank card pin he was shot in the head he died almost instantly and they kind of just left his body there by the dam and they drove off and about one kilometer away from the dam where they had left Baron's body there was 
was a house and Peter actually knew the family that stayed there. So he went to the door, started knocking on it and mind you this is like the AMs, the early hours of the morning. So Peter was knocking, knocking, knocking and eventually the family's domestic helper opened the door and she kind of just told him that like, sorry, the family isn't home at this moment, like they're on vacation, on holiday, so yeah, like sorry. But Peter just kind of, he wanted like a night, a place to stay for the night and he kind of convinced his domestic helper to let him in. Just like, you know, I know this family and also like, you know, I have my girlfriend with me I have a baby I have a baby you know and eventually she said okay you guys can just like stay the night and they weren't even there for that long literally before the sun rose they were gone and they were on the road and on their way to Bloemfontein once they got to Bloemfontein, they managed to withdraw all the money from Baron's account and as they were doing this, they saw a young man walking like on the road, like on the side of the road. So they stopped their car next to him and just offered him a ride and this was 25 year old Martin Mufosi. And he accepted the ride, like he got like accepted the lift rather, he got into the car and as they were driving, Peter asked him like if he smoked any marijuana, if he had any joints on him and Martin said he did and Peter said okay so they drove for a couple of minutes before he stopped at a clearing. And as soon as the car stopped, literally just like the other victims, Martin had no time to react. He was immediately pulled out of the car. He was robbed of all of his valuables, shot in the head and died almost instantly. What Charmaine and Peter don't know at this point was that police were on their trail. And this is because at this point, three bodies had already been found and Martin's body would be found like not too long after that and all of them had the same exact mo they were like men who were on their own needing a lift shot execution style and they were last seen with a couple that had a baby the couple's killing spree had literally only lasted 16 days and a couple of days after martin's death they were watching tv they were watching a show called police file when their faces popped up like Lucy Charmaine and Peter's faces popped up and they were wanted by the police for having committed four murders. The couple had somehow managed to keep a low profile despite all of the public attention that they were getting. And at some point, they had literally driven through a police block. Like, you know, sometimes JMPD has, JPMD, JMPD, JMPD, has like a roadblock where they stop like every car and like look at your license disc, your license, like driver's license. So I don't know if it was just like a normal like traffic police block or like actual like saps had the roadblock but there was a roadblock and then managed to go through that even though they were wanted and the car they were driving was wanted but somehow they went through that and they got to Bramfontein in Johannesburg and they had driven to a block of flats where one of Peter's brothers stayed with his wife Isabella. So the car stopped and Peter didn't even stop the engine from running, like it continued running. And Charmaine dressed up Peter Key in like a little blue outfit, covered him in a blanket, climbed up multiple stairs, knocked on the door and Peter's sister-in-law opened the door and Charmaine just like kind of handed her this blanket and ran away. And as soon as she opened it, she saw Peter Key and there was a note attached to it. And this note just kind of asked them to look after Peter Key and told them that they should go to the nearby police station because they would find a suitcase there that had clothes for Peter Key. After this, they left and they um, eventually just like left their car somewhere, like abandoned it because obviously police were looking for it too. And they stole a red motorcycle and they drove off, but eventually they were finally apprehended in Verenigung. Charmaine and Peter were finally in custody and were charged with four counts of murder and several counts of robbery and their trial finally began in October of 1983. 
Peter had his family support from the beginning, but Charmaine didn't have any support because obviously like, she hadn't seen her siblings or her father in years. She didn't even know if they knew like she was on trial or she was the one that they had been seeing on their TV screens. So she was like essentially alone and because of this like she would she would like face the media attention more than Peter would and she would like spit at the photographers, she would swear at them and because of the way she was acting towards the media, the judge decided to send her to a psychiatric for a psychiatric evaluation for three months um, just to see whether like she was okay or not and she was able to stand trial but she was found fit to stand trial but before she was sent to the psychiatric like before she was sent for her psychiatric evaluation her lawyer actually gave her 50 rand to kind of just buy food while she was there because this place was known for not having the best food and she kept this 50 rand didn't spend it and eventually when she was released from the psychiatric hospital she asked if she could stop at a store and she bought a little teddy bear for Peter Key and when she was in the holding cell waiting for like the trial to resume one of the social workers brought down Peter Key to go see his mother and literally as soon as she gave him this teddy bear he just started crying and it's so sad but like he didn't know who his mother was anymore like who is this woman and it just wasn't the reunion that she was hoping for and this was the last time that she would see Peter Key for like a long time. During the trial they were trying to determine whether Charmaine acted on her own accord or she was forced by Peter to commit the crimes that she had committed. However, Peter Key, not Peter Key, sorry, Peter and Charmaine kind of had a plan. Like Peter would say he was the one that shot the victims, but she would say no, she was the one that shot the victims. And this was kind of to create like reasonable doubt as to who committed this crime so that Peter wouldn't be found guilty of murder. And this is because, or like, yeah, this is why people believe Okay, people believe the reason why they did this was because at the time of this case, the death penalty was still here in South Africa. So if Peter was found guilty of murder, he would be sentenced to death. But Charmaine wouldn't be sentenced to death because she was 21 years old, so she wasn't of age. So for you to be sentenced to death, I think you had to be like 22 years old and older. So because she was only 21, like she wasn't eligible for the death penalty. So by doing this, maybe Peter wouldn't be found guilty and he wouldn't be sentenced to death. However, the judge saw right through this and he basically said at the end of the trial, like, you guys are both responsible for what happened to these four innocent men, whether you pulled the trigger or not. And then he looked at Charmaine and said, if you were of age, you would be receiving the same punishment as Peter. And that was being sentenced to death. So both Peter and Charmaine were found guilty of four counts of murder. Peter was sentenced to death and Charmaine would receive four life sentences. Then in July 1985, Peter Grundling climbed up 52 flights of stairs to the gallows where he stood on top of a trap door. A hood was placed over his head as well as a noose and then the trap door opened. Charmaine, on the other hand, was in prison and she was literally climbing up the ranks in gangs and she was very like well respected but also feared in prison and for the first like six years of her time in prison she spent most of it in solitary confinement but by the seventh year she started being like a hairdresser so she would do like the officer's hair as well as the prisoner's hair and she would obviously like get paid for this as well and she also got into art and sculpting during Charmaine's time in prison she never stopped thinking about her son Peter Key and she kind of just hoped that he had a better life than she did and he had just done better for himself and wouldn't follow like the same path that she and Peter did you know like she just wanted better for him but unfortunately this wasn't the case Peter just like his mother grew up in different foster care homes 
and he was a very angry child so because of this like he wouldn't stay in a foster care home for too long because like they just wouldn't want him because of like how angry he would get and literally by the age of 12 he had already started committing crimes and by the age of 18 he was sentenced um for robbery possession of drugs and stolen goods and he was in prison and whilst he was in prison he had asked to be transferred to a prison that was closer to his mother's prison and then he was like they approved of this he was moved to this prison and literally every second wednesday he would meet charmaine like in a supervised visit and Charmaine would give him all the money that she had gotten from her job as a hairdresser and they had they hadn't seen each other for so many years before this like the last time that she saw Peter Key was like when he was 18 months and now he's like 18 years and they're both in prison you know like it's not the life that she wanted for him a few years later, on the 19th of August 2004, despite having received four life sentences, Charmaine Phillips was released. And this is because a documentary had been released on the crimes that she and uh, Peter had committed. And during this documentary, they showed a letter that Peter had written before his like, execution, essentially. And in this letter, he said that he had committed all the crimes by himself and Charmaine wasn't a part of it. She had stayed in the car, like, you know, like she wasn't a part of these things that he had done, you know. And Charmaine's lawyers didn't even know that this letter existed until this documentary was released. And this kind of created reasonable doubt that she had been a part of these crimes. And it also brought up the question of whether, like, she did it on her own accord or like she was forced and this is because Charmaine had mentioned that she was um, abused by Peter and remember earlier I mentioned like the power dynamics they had because like she was 17 when they first got together and he was like in his 30s so she claimed that she was abused by him and on several occasions she had tried to leave the relationship however he had threatened her and said like if she leaves like he would kill her and that's the reason why she stayed and why during the trial she just kind of like put the blame on herself even though she was kind of forced into doing things that she didn't want to do so that's why she was released early for 18 months after Charmaine's release, her and Pitaki continued their mother-son relationship. However, in 2006, Pitaki died in his sleep at just the age of 23 years old. And after this, Charmaine went on to remarry and just, you know, continue her life. And yeah, that's it for today's case. I'm so interested to hear what you guys think about our first ever killer couple case and you know, South Africa's very own Bonnie and Clyde, whether you think Charmaine did everything willingly like, or she didn't, or if she deserves to be out right now just living her life like you know, they didn't take four people's lives. Let me know what you guys think and yeah, I'll see you guys next time.